Without holiness, no man will see the Lord, Hebrews 12, 14. God's not going to accept me if what in, what's inside of me is not clean. God will not take anything filthy, anything defiled. God says to the Christian, I want you to make sure, you make sure that you remain holy. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Look at Galatians 5 and look at verse 19. We know these works of the flesh. And Paul goes to great detail to explain to these Christians things that will separate them from God. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. He talks about idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Paul says, envies, murderings, drunkenness, revelings. I want to focus on the last one in the list. Paul says, and such the like. You see, preacher, can I go to this part? You know, the Bible doesn't say I can't do it. We start arguing just like our denominational friends when it comes to the holiness of our morality. Listen, preacher, the Bible doesn't say I can't do it. Paul says, and everything like it. You just plug it in. The Bible doesn't say you can't smoke weed. I mean, it's not spelled out in Scripture. Never saw that in 2 Timothy. Paul says, and all such like. Preacher, you're trying to tell me that my daughter, I know what they wear to the prom. I know that. But listen, Paul would say, and all such like. I know some people break out in a rash and have a seizure when you talk about modesty and dancing. Listen, I'm going to preach it anyway. If we're going to be dedicated to Christ, I need to make sure that personal holiness is a priority for me. I need to make sure that as it relates to my life, I want to be sold out for Jesus. I want to be focused on him. And the first area that that starts in my life, the first place it starts is I'm going to be personally holy to God. My life is going to be one that's consecrated to him in devotion. And I'm not going to straddle the fence as it relates to it. I'm not going to apologize for being God's servant. And I'm not going to applaud anybody else that's living in sin. Amen. Romans 1.32 says, And those that knew the judgment of God, that they that do such things are worthy of death. All right. Not only do the same, but they have pleasure in those that do them. That means on Facebook, I'm not going to like the picture of the two homosexuals. It's not so cute. I'm not going to like your picture that you went to the beach and you forsook the assembly. That's not a nice picture. Amen. Who know in the judgment of God that they that do such things are deserving of death. They don't practice those things, but they do cast their approval on those that do them. Number one is personal holiness. Number two, participation in the local congregation. Amen. I need to be dedicated to Christ, not only in personal holiness, but also as I'm dedicated to participating in the local congregation. You know, Jesus didn't save men and put them on islands. He could have done that. <laughs> Jesus could have saved us and said, now you get to heaven on your own might and on your own will. But Matthew 16 says, he said, on this rock I built my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. He said, Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And there are no saved people outside of that church. And when I come into that church, I must not just warm a pew. I need to participate in the local congregation. Amen. Imagine someone saying to a man, hey, you know what? You're my best friend. I really like you, but I can't stand your wife. How long do you think that friendship's going to last, right? How long is that husband going to last if he goes along with that? But you know in religion, that's what we do. You know in Christianity, that's what we do. I really, I really love the Lord. Not interested in the church. I really, I really love God. But you know what? I'm a little busy when it comes to men's work days. and I, I, I really love the Lord. Look at Acts chapter 2. I want to show you a few things about the first century church. We say, I want to restore New Testament Christianity. I'm the church. I'm a member of the church that you read about in the Bible. Well, if I'm going to have the mind of Christ and Christian dedication, part of that is my participation in the local congregation. I need to be somebody that says, there's no fine print in my contract with Jesus. And whatsoever needs to be done in the local work, I'm willing to engage in and also participate. Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Peter looks at those individuals on Pentecost and he says, This same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made them both Lord and Christ. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The first thing Peter did was he taught them the right doctrine. Now look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They made the right decision. And look at verse 42. 
And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and the breaking of bread and in prayers. They lived devoted lives. You see, that's how the church in the New Testament worked. You teach a man the right doctrine. It's up to him or her to make the right decision. And onward from there, Christian devotion. Verse 43, fear fell on every soul. 44, they sold things and had things in common. 45 and 46, daily in the temple, they taught the gospel. No wonder in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those being saved. You see, those individuals are sold out for Christ. Participation in the local congregation. I want to serve Jesus. I've obeyed the gospel. Now just tell me what do I need to do, and I want to get busy. Amen. That's all right. John chapter 4 and verse 35, Jesus would say to his disciples, Say not that yet there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. I say to you, lift up your eyes. And look out on the fields, for they're white already unto harvest. But Jesus is saying, you don't need to delay your work for me. Amen. You don't need to say when a more opportune time comes, you don't need to say, you know what, I'm going to wait until my kids are grown, and then I get busy. I get busy with the Lord. You know what, I'm going to wait until, once I get done with school preaching, I'm telling you, I'm going to be on fire for Jesus. Well, once I get in my senior years, oh, that's when I'm going to get serious about Christianity. Jesus says, don't say I'm waiting for a more opportune time. Jesus says, the time to work for me is right now. Amen. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the calendar of the Bible always reads today. Nobody ever lived in tomorrow. By the time tomorrow comes, you know it's always today. Nobody ever says tomorrow I'm going to serve God because you just can't be sure about that. First century church, those folks got busy. Acts chapter 6, and when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecian widows against the Hebrews. They were neglected in the daily ministration. You know what those men did in Acts 6. Listen, there's a problem. Some individuals say they're being left out as it relates to the provision of the widows. And the Bible says they selected seven men. Stephen, Nicanor, Simon, they selected those seven men, and those men were in charge of doing that work. And you know why I think they had to select seven? Because everybody would have wanted to serve if they didn't limit the number to seven. You know we would break our necks today trying to get seven men to do a work in a local congregation. You see, they had a problem with who couldn't do it. They had to limit the number. We have a problem with who can do it. The church doesn't need my complaint and it needs my cooperation. I know everybody's an expert on the back pew. Everybody says, if I was an elder, oh, I'd do it this way. Oh, if I was the preacher. We need more lessons on this. The first century church said... I need seven men to get busy, and I just need you to serve. I just need you to work, and I need you to do your part for the Lord. I want you to get busy. The church needs my attendance. The church needs my attention, and the church needs my activity. Can the church count on you to be present? Can the church count on you to be here? I read in the Bible of a principle that I like to call predicted righteousness. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10, they tell Daniel, listen, you can't keep... You can't keep praying to this God this way. You can't keep doing it. Daniel 6 and verse 10 says he went right back into the upper chamber and he prayed to his God as he had done aforetime. What is that? I've always done this. I'm going to always do it. John 18 and verse 2, when Judas comes with the mob to get Jesus, it says he was in the garden of Gethsemane praying as was his custom. He was always there. The best time to break into a Christian's home, and I don't want you to do this. I don't know who's here today. The best time to do it, though, would be Sunday morning. You know why? Your neighbors and individuals around you, it ought to be predicted righteousness. You know what? He or she, every Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, those folks, they're just never home. They're always there. You see, the church, it needs my attendance. But more than that, the church needs my attention. You talk about participation in the local congregation. We heard a lesson on worship. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must do what? Worship him in spirit and in truth. Oh, we're experts in the truth area. Singing, praying, preaching, giving, the Lord's Supper. We got the truth down, but what about worshiping God in spirit? You see, my mind needs to be engaged as I worship God because if I don't do it with the right mindset, I can do all five of those things and never worship. I can be a member of the church for 20, 30 years and never worship God acceptably. If I don't engage in it with my mind, my worship won't get past this ceiling and God will not accept it. If I'm singing songs worried about is whatever I'm cooking at home burning on the crock pot, I'm not worshiping God in spirit. We better get, I don't know how many cups of coffee you have to drink to worship God. Listen, I know there's something that happens when I come in here. 
And all of a sudden, my eyelids get so heavy, I don't know, I just don't know what I'm going to do, preacher. I just can't stay up. It's not the preacher's job to be so boring that he puts you to sleep, but it's also not my job to keep you awake. You ought to do that because you're worshiping God. See, the church needs my undivided attention. And then the church needs my activity. The church has enough, enough advisors. Enough cheerleaders, enough complainers. The church needs my activity. The church needs me to get involved. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. The church at Corinth, they have a problem with the resurrection. And so Paul spends 57 verses telling these Christians, don't let anybody Houdini you out of the idea of a resurrection. Jesus rose from the grave. He's the first fruits of those that sleep. You are raised from the grave as well. And since all of these things are true, since there's really a resurrection... Since Jesus really did overcome the grave, verse 58, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see in verse 58, Paul says, always abounding. That word simply means, I want you to overflow. If this is the standard, Paul's saying, you go beyond that, you do more. Always about. Don't say, listen, I've been doing this job for years. If they don't get somebody else, I'm just done. So many times in the church, we forget one thing, and that is we work with the brethren for the Lord. We don't work for the brethren. Yeah. You see, sometimes we get frustrated. And if the elders get me mad, I'm not teaching next quarter. I just won't do it. I'm not engaging in that activity. I don't like that program of the church. I'm just out of it. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We do a lot of things in this life that are sometimes in vain. We do a lot of things for men, and we're often overlooked, unappreciated, passed over, misunderstood. But Paul says, when it comes down to my labor in the Lord, it's not in vain. You've never done nothing for the Lord that you're going to regret. Nobody gets to the end of their life and says, you know what? I sure wish I read my Bible less. You know, I sure wish I would have talked to less people about Jesus. I would have spent more time at the office. I would have prayed less. I would have focused on eternal matters less. Nobody gets to the end of the life and says that. Because you know something? I realize in that day what's been true all along. My labor's not in vain in the Lord. In Acts chapter 8, there arose a great persecution against the church at Jerusalem. And all of the disciples were scattered abroad throughout Judea. Verse 2 says that they lamented over Stephen. They carried him to his grave. Saul made great havoc of the church in verse 3, entering into men and women's houses and hauling them off the prison. But in verse 4 of Acts 8, it says, Then those that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. 